Uh, I'd like to welcome you <coughs> again, if I haven't welcomed you already, to our um, celebration of Global One Health Day. Uh, tomorrow is the second annual Global One Health Day that is celeb celebrated worldwide this whole week, hopefully in over around 500 different locations around the globe. Um, we have been part of the One Health movement and have been celebrating One Health actually from before the One Health Day was a thing, uh, but we're very, very happy to take part in that. And our One Health celebration is today, actually tomorrow with a radio show that I host every uh, Friday once a month. We're going to devote that to One Health. That's on XM Radio 109 at noon, if anyone wants to tune in. Uh, I do that every month. And then um, on Saturday, we have a, a conference, that, a One Health conference for physicians and veterinarians. So we have one for the public today and one on Saturday for physicians and veterinarians. The, the idea of One Health is, um, is understanding that veterinary medicine and human medicine, when we combine them, uh, we have better outcomes for everyone. We, have, we all have a lot to learn from each other, and, and when we take the best of human medicine, the best of veterinary medicine, and work together as a team, we can come up with new cures, new diagnoses, new ways of doing things to benefit all species. My mic is on. <laughs> it says it is. Uh, it said it was. It turned off? I'm going to seizure from it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm just going to watch it like this. Um, so we know that when we, and this is something veterinarians have known for a long time, that we can you know, take things from human medicine into veterinary medicine. But the other way around is relatively new for the human medicine establishment to, to realize that there are things that animals and people, of course, live so closely together now, and that we really have to look at all of us uh, animals and people to understand uh, modern medicine. And that's become much more established in human medicine. There actually, One Health is taught at medical schools uh, these days around the country, and we have this global celebration of One Health. So we are very happy to open our doors on this day to the public and, and, um, and welcome you for this day that we've celebrated today. The, the, our public education um, efforts, and, and including today, are done by the Houston Institute. The Houston Institute is a new institute that we have here at the Animal Medical Center devoted entirely to the education of the public for animal health. Um, it has many, many a uh, aspects to it. We have lectures here that we give monthly. Um, today is an example of that. We'll have another one in December uh, for the public, al always free. This is in and out. Um, If we, if we charge for these, we could have better microphones, but here we go. Okay, uh, always free for the public. Um, we have a, a monthly Facebook Live program that we put on. Um, and then we also have our website where we have information on animal health that anyone from around the world can look up at any time. Um, these lectures will also be posted on our website. Our goal is that anyone around the world that has any question about animal health will go to the Animal Medical Center website, which is amcny.org from there to the USTAN um, Institute page, and we'll find out any information they could possibly need to know about animal health. So that, that's what we're doing here, and again, I'm so happy to have you here. I'd like to ask, ask, thank our sponsors for the day. We have many, many sponsors. We have a representative of one of our sponsors here. This is Jonathan Howard from Zoetis. Zoetis is a very large um, animal health company that um, has many, many products that I'll be talking about today in, in, the, in our talk that, that really have made huge advances for animal health. We have many other sponsors as well. Um, you can check out their, their names on uh, as, you, as you leave tonight. So thank you again for coming and welcome and uh, we are all celebrating One Health Day together. What I chose to talk about today is or tonight and sit back and get comfortable because this will take a while um, are, are the diseases that we share with animals. Animals now are part of our family. Um, and we share our beds, we share our food, and we share our diseases. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about three diseases that are kind of examples, but they're also very much in the news right now, and, very, uh, and there's a lot of things that we should know about them. Uh, leptospirosis, Lyme disease, and the flu. 
Who knew that dogs and even cats can get the flu just like people do? Uh, now, most of the time when we talk about diseases we share with animals, people automatically think about what we call zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are, am I walking around too much? Okay, okay. Um, zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transmitted from animals to people. There is the other way around. There are diseases, reverse zoonoses, that are transmitted from people to animals. But uh, like, like, for instance, that could be the flu. It uh, could be a disease like that. Um, but uh, zoonotic diseases, the classic ones we think about, for instance, this is rabies. This is the rabies virus. I'm sure you all recognize that. Um, uh, every, I'm sure everybody heard that uh, actually we had a death this week in Florida from rabies. Um, it was from a vampire bat, not this one, but one like it. Um, bats are a major problem for rabies, of course, in, in South and Central America, and there's becoming more of a problem in the Southern United States. Uh, we have rabies from raccoons. We actually, even in, in terms of domestic animals, our biggest problem for rabies is actually with cats. Cats transmit more rabies than dogs, probably because we are better at vaccinating dogs than, than, than we are cats. So we should all know that. So that, that's kind of a classic zoonosis. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about today. And this is another little classic zoonosis. This is um, plague, Yersinia pestis. It's a classic plague. None of, nobody in this room, even I, am not old enough to remember the big plague of the 1800s. Um, and this, you can't really see this guy's shirt, but it said, it says, uh, I hitched a ride on a trade ship and all I got was Yersinia pestis. Um, <laughs> that is a picture because they're transmitted by rats. But interestingly, the plague also has a vector. And when we talk about vector-borne diseases, when we talk about Lyme disease, and the vector for the plague is the fleas. So we go from the rats into the fleas, into people. And obviously that was a hor horrendous disease at some point, and it's still around. People still get the plague, not so much in this country, but in other parts of the world um, for pretty often, and, and cats can get the plague as well. So those are zoonotic diseases. I'm only going to talk about one true zoonotic disease tonight, and that's leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, or sometimes called rat fever, is a very important zoonotic disease in the world. It's actually today the number one zoonotic disease in the world in terms of human death. More people are dying today around the world of leptospirosis than any other zoonotic disease. And that includes diseases like rabies and the, and the plague. We don't hear about it as much um, because it's not so much in this area of the world. Um, although that has recently changed. Leptospirosis is a disease caused by these, um, I think, rather lovely spirochetes. These are the bacteria. They're like little corkscrews. And um, they infect people. Uh, they infect, uh, people get sick, dogs get sick. In our area, the raccoon is probably the biggest culprit, although rats are a big cause of that as well. If you, you might remember, then last November, it made the press that three people got leptospirosis in the Bronx. That made the press, to be honest, uh, because it was also associated with a public housing issue. Um, we, we have about three to five people every year that get leptospirosis in New York City most of them homeless and doesn't seem to make the press as much, unfortunately. The big outbreak that we're seeing right now in people in this country is in Puerto Rico. Um, there's a tremendous problem with leptospirosis in Puerto Rico right now. It has made the press. It's been on the major news in New York Times. We have probably about at least 75 cases right now of leptospirosis in Puerto Rico, including four deaths. Um, it's very hard to know exactly how many people are suffering right now in Puerto Rico because there wasn't a lot of testing done initially. I'm on um, this very fascinating listserv called the International Leptospirosis Society, and it took a few weeks to actually get testing done for the people in Puerto Rico after the, the hurricane. So we don't actually know the true magnitude of the problem there yet, but as people are drinking from streams and, and, uh, and unclean water, that's where the problem comes in. So leptospirosis is a bacterial disease. Uh, it comes from the urine of animals, mostly rodents, uh, but including raccoons, um, and it, 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 you get infected by coming to contact with water with urine in it. So if you have a, in the city a rat that pees in a puddle, and then a dog goes and licks that puddle, or a person walks on that puddle with, with uh, a cut on their foot, or in many places in the world, people get it from um, the rat urine mixing with water they use to bathe or wash their clothes. That's how people get leptospirosis. So it's in environments like this, where you get it, um, and it's, it's, again, very, very, very common. 
There's two types of hosts for leptospirosis, uh, meaning in the, in the environment. Um, some animals can live in peace with these bacteria and spread them throughout their lives. And again, in New York City, the raccoon is probably the worst culprit. I looked at New York City raccoons years ago when I was at Cornell um, in Central Park, and about 50% of the raccoons in Central Park were positive. Uh, we know that in Chicago, which is the situation is a little bit worse than New York, about 60% of the raccoons are positive. So if you go to downtown Chicago, Miracle Mile, fancy stores, and you see a raccoon, 60% chance that it's actually positive for leptospirosis. Here in the city, probably around 50%. So they get infected at a young age, and they spread the disease over time and, and don't die from it. The bacteria have adapted themselves to live with those animals, and that includes many, many animals that we see all the time um, around, even in the city, including skunks and rats and mice and raccoons um, and others. People and dogs are the incidental host, meaning that the bacteria are not adapted to live in us in peace, and that's why they cause disease. That's why we get so sick. And people and dogs can get terribly sick, including dying from this infection. And this is just a short list of the hosts, but you can see that now I would love to say, well, we just have to separate ourselves and our dogs from these animals and their urine, and we'll be fine. The problem is you can't do that. Even in you know, Upper East Side, you cannot separate our dogs and ourselves from rats and mice and skunks and raccoons. Maybe we can from pigs and horses and cows, but not from the other ones. And so when we come to prevention, we're going to be talking about, in dogs, vaccination as the key to prevention because we can't really separate them out. This used to be thought of as a rural disease many years ago, a disease of hunting dogs and dogs that are out in the fields chasing ducks. That's not true anymore. We see that disease, we see it all the time. We had one today, all the time here in the Upper East Side, as well as every other urban or suburban place around the country. So really, really common problem in dogs, not as common in people, but really common in dogs. And people uh, around the world, a ton of leptospirosis. In the US, we only have about 200 reported cases. Now the reporting is not that great, so there may be more cases than that. Outside of this year with our Puerto Rico issue, about 200 reported cases, typically half of them are in Hawaii. Hawaii is endemic for leptospirosis. If you go to Hawaii, which I would still recommend doing, um, you'll see signs on the rivers and lakes, do not swim danger leptospirosis. Um, in, in Hawaii, it's the rats that spread it, uh, probably associated with the sugarcane industry. Um, in the continental US, it could be all those animals that I listed, and people get it either from um, in the inner cities, like, like the people in the Bronx, or just swimming in lakes and ponds, or sometimes from animals directly, um, including large animals, uh, um, cows and horses. The symptoms are a little bit different in people uh, than in dogs. In people, the symptoms starts a few days after infection, and they're typically flu-like. So headache, sore throat, fever, muscle pain, very nonspecific times. How many of us are going to rush to the doctor if we have a sore throat, headache, muscle pain, versus just staying in bed and saying we probably have the flu? Not great, though. We know that in people, if you're not treated very quickly with antibiotics, the prognosis goes way down. It can be a terrible disease in people unless treated very quickly. Um, after a while, people get um, their eyes can become bloodshot, and then they'll become jaundiced, meaning a yellow coloring in their eyes or in their gums because of the liver failure that starts to occur as a result of the disease. Uh, there is often, also in people, a per-acute death syndrome, not trying to scare you, but there is a syndrome of, ma of a very acute death within four days of infection with massive bleeding in the lungs that happens sometimes in South America. In dogs, yeah, very quick. That's why it's called, yeah, very quick. In dogs, what we see is lethargy and appetence, just a sick dog, general clinical signs. And that's why there's a, for years, there's been a misconception in, among veterinarians that it's not that common because these are very nonspecific signs and only very late, just like in people, do we see the classic kind of kidney failure and liver failure that we were all taught in vet school. And so the challenge has always been to diagnose it early when the signs are just not, uh, not eating, vomiting, and, not, and, and being lethargic, which is every other dog that comes into our practice, right? So it's a really common presentation. It's up to us to say, oh, that could be leptospirosis, and, and then we need to test for it. Okay, we would do that based on the physical findings, the clinical signs, as well as the initial blood work that's run that would give us hints that we're talking about leptospirosis. In people, 
it's, it's up to the physician to say, okay, where have you been lately? Um, have you been in an area? Have you been swimming in a, in a pond? Um, it's not an easy diagnosis to make easier uh, either. And unfortunately, the tests, and this is true for all the diseases I'm going to be talking about, the tests in people are way behind the tests that we have for dogs. We have way better testing, way quicker testing in dogs, and that's because we have um, a quicker, more responsive um, process for developing tests in dogs than we do for people. We're not worried as much about the FDA, and, and, and we're, we're more worried about giving rap rapid ability for veterinarians to, to do things in the clinic. We'll talk more about that. This is a distribution of where leptospirosis was in dogs in, in a five, over a five-year period. So it's pretty much the whole country. You can see heavy, heavy northeast. Southeast, we actually saw a shift after Katrina. where We saw more leptospirosis um, moving around the southeast. Mountain region, and of course, the west coast is full. We're somewhere here, and we have tons of leptospirosis here. This is a... a a map of, di of vaccination, and, and this, this is the, the number of dogs that we think have been vaccinated. This is actually Zoetis data, so thank you, Jonathan. Um, these are the number of dogs that were vaccinated by state over a five-year period. And this again, dogs. We don't have a vaccine approved for people in this country, unfortunately. Um, and it looks like New York State is doing great. It's really dark here. It looks like we're vaccinated a lot. But unfortunately, when you look at this map on the right, which is the number of dogs vaccinated divided by the number of dogs, so the percent dogs that were vaccinated, we're not doing so hot. New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, California. Look at, look at how much lepto is in Florida and California and how poor a job they're doing there in vaccination. So it's actually some of the, and maybe there's a cause and effect here, but it's some of the states that vaccinate the least are seeing the most lepto. So there's an educational component for veterinarians that's on us uh, to, to increase the amount of the, the level of vaccination for this disease that is a, 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 um, a terrible disease. The dog that we saw today here um, may or may not make it because it came quite late. Um, it, it is a terrible disease in, in dogs as well. Uh, the test that we use here is actually a test that was made by Zoetis. It's called a witness test. It may look like another test that some of you may recognize. Um, but basically, it's a very quick test. It, it turns positive within a few days after, after clinical signs develop or within a week after exposure. And we can run it in the clinic. Uh, one line means it's negative, two lines means it's positive. Uh, it is an antibody test, um, so it does take a few days to turn positive, but it's a very accurate way of, of testing this for this disease. So again, this is something that the hu human medicine does not have. They would have to send out the test and wait for the results and send it to the CDC. It's not easy to test for. We have a much more reliable, quicker test uh, for dogs, unfortunately, than we do for, for people. Uh, so th this test will be run by the veterinarian if they suspect leptospirosis based on the history, the clinical um, signs, and initial um, screening blood work. Other tests that are run uh, are PCR, which is actually looking for DNA of the organism. And then people, they would actually try to culture the organism from the blood. We don't have the ability to do that in veterinary medicine because it requires pretty much that the culture is done in the hospital where the person is. And that can be done in a large medical center with an infectious disease unit. We're not really set up to do that in veterinary medicine. But we have these rapid tests instead. We get a lot quicker answer. Uh, antibiotics for the treatment in people and in dogs, and again, if given early, um, they're very, very effective. We had um, six dogs from the NYPD come back recently from Puerto Rico um, from being deployed there with FEMA, and we had them all come in. They all got that witness test, and if there were any positive, we haven't had a positive, luckily, but if there were any positive, we would recommend treating that dog quickly um, to make sure they don't get the, the more severe disease after that. I don't know if the officers were tested as well, but we definitely, we definitely tested the dogs. Prevention for leptospirosis, I would love to say let's minimize contact with the bacteria. So obviously not have standing water, not swim in creeks and ponds. Easy to say, you know, when, when you're living here and, and you have all the food that we have in the back. Hard to say in the third world, whereas the, the safe water is really hard to come by. Um, but even, having, even with that, uh, you cannot go outside if you're a dog and not come into contact with urine from a rat or a mouse or a raccoon or a mole. And so in really anywhere in this country, we cannot rely on environmental protection and we have to vaccinate. And this is a vaccine that we highly recommend that every dog in this country get, definitely every dog in the Northeast, Midwest, Southeast, and West Coast. Uh, it's a very safe vaccine, it's very effective, and nothing is perfect in life, but it does a really good job 
in preventing the disease. So that, that is a vaccine that we feel very strongly should be 100% core for every dog um, that, that is in, in this area. Cool questions at the end. Okay, questions at the end. I, I'm so dying to ask you about questions, but I have to wait till the end. Um, okay, Lyme disease. We're moving on to Lyme disease. Lyme disease is not a zoonotic disease. We do not get Lyme from animals. We share Lyme disease with animals. Ad dogs get it, horses get it, we get it, but we all get it from the same place, and that's from ticks. So this is now a vector-borne disease that we share with animals. It's not a zoonotic disease. You cannot get it from your dog. Why is it called Lyme disease? Because one of the first cases was diagnosed um, in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Luckily, it's not old Lyme disease. That would make it even worse. People sometimes call it Lyme disease. That drives me nuts. It was not Dr. Lyme. It comes from old Lyme, Connecticut. That's why it's called Lyme disease. And the bacteria is called Borrelia burgdorferi. Really, burgdorferi was the one who discovered it. Um, and it's also a lovely squiggly spirochete. Actually, it looks kind of like leptospirosis. Here, this more looks more like stream beams. But it does look like leptospirosis. They're actually related. They're cousins, which makes my life easier if I want to work on both of them. Um, but this is a tick-borne disease now. It's a vector-borne disease. It has to have a tick. This is the deer tick or the exodus tick. Um, it has to come from the tick. So uh, it is not contact directly from animals. And these are the lovely ticks that we're talking about. Remember, the nymphs, which is the stage that most infect people, is the second stage in life. They start with larva, they move on to nymphs, and then they become adults. The larva is really, really small. The larva, when it hatches, it's really small. It pretty much can only feed on mice. And mice, especially white field mice, are the reservoir for this disease. So the larva is born I, I like to say born free, but born clean. It feeds on an infected mouse. It can, becomes, in the, the bacteria go into the gut of the tick from the mouse. The, the tick will then molt into a nymph. That happens in the spring, and that's when most people get infected by the nymph. The reason people get infected by the nymph is it's tiny. It's the size of, of a pencil head, it's the size of a tiny little freckle, very easy to miss. The tick has to be attached to the person for at least 24 hours to transmit the disease. And so often the adults, the big, fat, gross adults, we see on ourselves, but we often miss the nymphs. And that's why most people are infected by nymphs in the spring. Now, when I say spring, spring is a relative term. All the ticks need, and this is important, is about 55 degrees and up. So even if it's in February and it's 55 degrees, <coughs> the nymphs could be out. So we used to have winters, you know, where it would be 25 degrees until March or April, that's not the case anymore. So we have days in January and February where people are getting infected. That happened a lot this year. If you remember, March was very warm. Um, and a lot of people got infected in March. It typically doesn't, didn't used to start happening until around April. Dogs are often infected by the adults. Their skin's a little thicker, plus we miss them more often on dogs. And that happens in the summer and, and fall, typically. So this is uh, all the animals that these ticks can feed on. Um, they, they can be basically feel on any mammal. Uh, we don't see clinical disease in all these mammals, but we definitely see it in dogs and in people. So where is Lyme? This has also changed a lot in the last years. I was talking to a, I don't now remember if this was a regular person or veterinarian, it's all a blur, but someone today who was telling me that in their house, um, that you know, she still lives in the house next door to where she grew up, and they used to never have ticks, and now there's ticks everywhere. This was, and this was in um, the North Carolina area. Um, this is a map of where these ticks were. The blue and green, uh, the blue and red are the exotic ticks in the East Coast. The green is in the West Coast. Um, and this was a, this is a map that was true up until 1996. And this is what's been, uh, true up until 2015. And you can see how, and the red is where there's a lot, the blue is where there's a little. You can see how the whole thing turned red um, as the ticks migrated uh, west from the coast and, and north and south. When I far, I've been working on Lyme and leptospirosis since about 2002. When I first started working on, on Lyme, we, we used to say, okay, there's no, the, it goes down into Virginia, but only northern Virginia. There's no Lyme south of Richmond. Now, you know, there's Lyme up until about Atlanta. Northern Atlanta has Lyme. South of Atlanta, not so much. Um, that's kind of the border now. So it's gone all the way down into Georgia um, from Virginia in terms of that border. And there's plenty of Lyme in Florida too. I don't know if any of you 
go up and down the coast, you know, in the winter, um, but there's plenty of lime in the southeast, including in Florida as well. Um, what do you do when you find a tick? I was asked that question today um, on, on the radio. When you find a tick, don't just throw it, first of all, remove it. Uh, don't throw it away. You either save it in a little plastic bag or take a picture of it because it, it may become important whether you removed it from yourself or from your dog, what kind of tick that was. Okay, this is a website that's run, um, it's called tickencounter.org. It's run by the University of Rhode Island, um, where Jackie used to work. Um, and this is actually a free service. You can submit a picture of the tick and they will tell you what it is. Um, they will accept donations, so you, know, you can do that too. Um, but this is important because what the tick is, which, which tick it was, and whether it's engorged or not, will dictate to us what needs to happen in terms of treatment. In, in a child, if we have a tick that was a, a, a deer tick that's engorged, they will often treat, and then removed from a child, they will often treat the, the, the child. Um, they, can, they can also actually submit the tick to be an, analyzed. Unfortunately, you have to sacrifice the tick to do that. Um, but they will uh, open up the tick and, and look within its gut. And if there's Lyme bacteria in its gut, they will recommend treating that child or that person. We don't typically do that for dogs. It's expensive to do for dogs. Uh, but we do recommend showing the veterinarian either the tick or a picture of the tick, figure out if it's a deer tick or not, is it, is it engorged or not. And then if, if you remove a tick from your dog, the recommendation would be come in in about a month, we'll test. It takes about a month for the test to turn positive, unfortunately. We'll test your dog at that time and treat if, if he or she is, is positive. This is another instance where, in a One Health way, where veterinary medicine is way, way ahead of human medicine. We as a profession recommend screening for tick-borne diseases, screening for infectious diseases, meaning we recommend that every dog every year gets tested for these diseases. Um, because we do that, we have a very good idea of where they are and what the prevalence is. Prevalence meaning the chance of a dog being positive in any individual area. I can tell you by zip code, where, no matter where you live in this country, what the chance of your dog being positive for Lyme is based on the fact that veterinarians in that same zip code have been screening and the data is shared on a, on a public website. Um, they don't do that in people, right? In people, they only look at you if you're sick. If you go into the doctor and say, I think I'm sick, they don't proactively screen people or children or any of us for infectious diseases. So we, so we are able to generate a much better map in, in um, veterinary medicine, uh, which is a lot more expensive than the human map, which is only based on when people went in and said, I'm sick. The CDC actually uses the doggy map in a little bit of a stealth fashion. They don't advertise this on their website, but they use the doggy map to track Lyme and other tick-borne diseases because they know that they understand the value of, of, of prospective screening. So you can see if you live in North Carolina, you think there's no Lyme if you are a person. This is the human map, but there's tons of Lyme uh, in North Carolina. And if dogs are getting it, people are getting it too. It just get, doesn't get to the, to the CDC website. How do we diagnose Lyme? This is one area where people are lucky. People are lucky in that most people have a rash. 70-ish um, percent of people develop a rash. It's called an erythema migrans or a target lesion or a bullseye rash. And this is where the ticks were. So this is a person that had one, two, one, two, three, I think four um, ticks at least. In the, every, every one of those circles had a tick in the middle of it. That tick, this is kind of gross, but it's okay because you're not eating anymore, to spit up the organism into the, the bacteria, into the skin. Those bacteria move in the skin away from the center and, that, and the inflammatory response in the skin forms this characteristic rash. Um, this lasts for about 30 days after the tick was there. It'll show up when the tick is there or within a few days after the tick is gone um, and is what we call pathognomonic, meaning it, a physician that sees that can say, okay, this person has Lyme disease, this person needs treatment. Um, and if we treat for one day or three days at this time, there's a very good chance to clear the bacteria because the bacteria are all right there in the skin. They're susceptible to the antibiotic and it's a great opportunity to treat. Problem is, if you don't have, so only 70-ish percent of people have that rash. So if you're unlucky and don't have the rash, you're obviously not gonna go to the doctor. We miss the opportunity to treat it early. Or if you have the rash but miss it, it doesn't itch. If it's on your back and you don't, you know, check yourself out in that way that often, and you miss the rash, you also miss the opportunity 
to go to the doctor and be treated. So please, if anybody in, in where we are, of course, in Lyme and Dame areas, has a rash that looks like this, definitely, definitely, definitely go to the physician, get treated, because if you don't, what happens is the bacteria go deep into the body, and then the chances are much, much higher that that person will develop systemic types of signs of Lyme disease versus just having the rash. Okay, so the rash is a chance to cure. Um, after the rash, or sometimes at the time of the rash, there will often be, also be swollen lymph nodes in the area. And then these person, especially if there's a, more than one, they don't feel great. They, it, they do kind of have a flu-like syndrome as well. There's a lot of inflammation associated with all this that's happening. So they'll have a headache, they might have a fever, they might feel dizzy. I was at the, I, I w was with a, it doesn't matter who this was, some kid um, a couple years ago at the beach in, in um, New Jersey. And he all day was talking about going to the beach and it was finally time to go to the beach. And then he didn't feel well. And you know, we, we put his bathing suit on and he, has eight, he had eight of these rashes on him. He was actually, uh, belonged to friends of mine from Connecticut. The kid belonged to friends of mine from Connecticut. I, I guess not belonged, he was from Connecticut too. <laughs> anyway, um, and he, he definitely did not feel well. He was treated the next, by the next day he was fine. Um, but they, people don't feel great at the time of this. If you miss that stage and you're not treated, then you have this whole thing, uh, which is joint pain and headaches and muscle pain and, and, and Bell's palsy and um, uh, fatigue and all of these systemic signs that are much more similar to what we actually see in dogs. Okay, so it's, again, it's if you're lucky and you have that rash, it's important to get treatment and not to blow it off. Um, People with chronic Lyme have neurologic signs or chronic joint disease. It's a horrible, terrible, debilitating disease that every time I give a lecture um, and there's someone there with Lyme, they always come up to me at the end and they have a really, a really sad story about how that being infected with Lyme has changed their lives, never for the better. So it's a terrible disease in people. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anywhere near the tools in people that we do to, for dogs in terms of prevention. So we can only try to do what we can to prevent this disease from happening to people. Unfortunately, you can get this over, you get infected over and over and over again. Um, there's actually a group of people, there's a study done on people that had a recurrent sinus. So every year they would get sick, and many of them thought that they just had the same infection that was recrudescing every year. But actually it turns out they were getting reinfected every year. They were going out in the garden in the spring, getting infected, getting sick, getting over it kind of, and then next year they get infected again. Yeah, yeah. So in dogs and people, and this is really important to understand, even if you've had Lyme in the past, this is not like the mumps or the measles or the chicken pox. You can get it over and over and over again because each, actually each bacteria looks different. So our immune system can't deal with it even if it's already seen it before in the past. So it is, it's a really terrible disease. In dogs, dogs don't get that rash. Um, so we miss the opportunity to treat dogs early like that. Their skin is different. They, we just don't see that rash in dogs. So they kind of skip to the middle stage which is the joint disease, pain, pain, fever, swollen lymph nodes. This is a classic example of a dog with Lyme disease. This dog is a pretty stoic dog. Um, he seemed fine one day. The next day he just would not walk uh, be because of Lyme disease. Other less common presentations is really this um, fatal kidney manifestations that dogs get. Interestingly that people don't get. Uh, people do not have kidney disease from Lyme, but some dogs do. And that's always the, uh, my biggest scare for, for dogs that are Lyme positive is really develop this kidney disease, which if not treated very aggressively can be fatal, um, which is kind of how I got into the whole Lyme story. We diagnose Lyme again with very early, very rapid, very uh, um, easy to use tests, typically in the clinic. In people, uh, they don't have that availability, so they'll send out the blood, it'll take a while to get an answer. They either use a, a two-tier approach, two different tests, or sometimes they use PCR. Uh, but again, the diagnostics in dogs are a lot easier, quicker, and faster um, than, than the tests that are available for people. Prevention. In dogs, we have a whole package of prevention. And dogs need it. We need to use every aspect of this package in Lyme endemic areas. We start with dealing with the environment. I'll talk about that in a minute. We should be checking our dogs every day, every time we go out for a walk, every time at the end of the, in, in the evening, it should be a ritual to check our dogs as our kids. We'll talk about that in a minute too. If you, if you have a kid that's playing out in the yard or going to the park, that kid needs to be checked for ticks before bedtime as part of a daily routine. 
Uh, but dogs need to be checked for ticks. And then we have the advantage of dogs of, of products that we can use for tick control. We have very safe, very effective products that we can give to dogs um, to kill ticks on the dogs. And it, it's important to understand that those ticks don't just carry Lyme. I'm only talking about Lyme today because I don't have a lot of time. But there's other diseases in those ticks that we don't actually have, even have a vaccine for. So it's really important to kill those ticks even if a dog is vaccinated for Lyme. One of the products that we, that we use here in our hospital is called Semperica. Uh, there's information on, uh, outside about it. And it kills ticks very quickly with just an oral once a month um, medication. So it's very easy to use these products that, today and they're very effective in killing ticks. And then on top of that, we recommend in endemic areas, so all those areas where there was a ton of Lyme, also vaccination. Um, in this area, if a dog leaves Manhattan in any direction, there's ticks everywhere. So we recommend in our hospital that every dog also be, in, be vaccinated for Lyme. So should be on tick control and also get vaccinated for Lyme. They're very safe and very effective vaccines. Um, and so we have a, a really good way of preventing this disease in dogs. Um, Unfortunately, none of those things are available for people. All we have for people is dealing with the environment. So it is very, if you have a house that looks like this, um, what's important in terms of treating the environment um, is not, ha is if you have a, gra if there is a backyard with grass, there should be a barrier between the grass and the woods. Uh, ticks will not cross a, um, a barrier of wood chips or even concrete uh, they're very, very sensitive to dehydration. They will not venture out into the sun without shade. So, of course, they can be carried out on mice, rats, deer, dogs, whatever, but they won't venture out on their own. So this is somewhat helpful. The other thing you can do if you have a lawn is to cut it really short. Again, they will not be out in the sun. So if you have a low mo mowed lawn, um, there will be no ticks on that lawn. If you have high grass where they can hide underneath the leaves, there will be ticks on that lawn. The, the analogy is that there's never ticks on the green of the golf course, only in the rough. And that's true, I don't play golf, but if I did, I'd probably have a Lyme disease because there is, there is actually a published paper correlating the golf handicap with the, uh, with the likelihood of having Lyme disease. <laughs> the you can Google it, it's true. The worse the golfer, the more Lyme disease. So anyway, we can deal with the environment. We can also, I also do recommend spraying the yard, but so, so mowing the lawn short, having a barrier between the lawn and the woods, spraying the yard is important. Removing ticks every day, this is the method I like, is a sharp scissors running by the head. And then really, in terms of other prevention, we don't have a lot. There are clothes, the, 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 the way human, I don't want to say medicine, the way the human market is moving is towards clothing that's pre-embedded with um, um, T materials that will kill ticks. Really the only thing that's approved for use in people is DEED. Um, you can spray your shoes with DEED. You, you should be tucking your, you should be wearing long pants, putting your pants in your socks. I know that sounds like high tech to basically put your pants in your socks, but that's really all we have. It's just spraying your shoes makes a really, really big difference. There's a study done in people showing that spraying your shoes and then walking out into a tick embedded, a tick rich environment you decrease the risk of, of having a ticks by over 90%. So spraying your shoes before you're going out on hikes, putting your socks, your, your pants in your socks. Off-label, not saying, but there have been veterinarians that have used doggy products on themselves, but that's, you know, we're not supposed to do that. Um, and then I try to keep my hair tied back um, when, I, when I'm out in the garden. So again, prevention in dogs, we have a variety of oral of products for um, tick control or, t or killing ticks. We have spot-on products, we have collars, we have these oral products, and you can even combine them. I do recommend to our clients that go into areas with heavy, heavy exposure, like the woods, to combine potentially a collar and an oral product to get the maximum protection for their dogs, and then vaccination on top of that. Okay. Five minutes for the flu. Who knew that dogs, did everybody in this room know that dogs and cats get the flu? Or that dogs even get the flu? Everybody gets the flu. Um, so what is the flu? The flu is, the, is an influenza virus. Um, it's a family of viruses. And when we talk about the flu, if you want to be like the cool kids, we characterize the flu viruses by two um, different antigens, or two different spots on the virus. One has an H and one has an N. So we talk about H this and N that, and we talk about the different strains of flu. Um, 
And so it's a whole family of viruses. Now what's very typical of flu viruses is they're very host specific in terms of transmission. Meaning human flu is transmitted from people to people. Um, it would be very, and that's common, right? Avian flu is transmitted from bird to bird. What's not uncommon or what is common is for flu to jump species in a single individual. So it's very common for a person to get avian flu, for instance. That happens all the time. Or for a dog to get human flu, or for a person to get dog flu. That likely happens all the time. What doesn't happen all the time, and what is a big deal when it happens, is when that, new, when that virus then takes and, st and, and sticks in that species. So if I got a flu, so let's say I got a fl flu from a bird, if I was then to transmit that to another person, that would be a big deal. That has never happened. That's what the whole world is scared about. What if avian flu gets into people and starts being transmitted from people to people? That, that's the big scare, right? So just me, so if, if one of these dogs had the flu and I got it from that dog, that's not a huge surprise. What would be a huge surprise is if I then transmitted it to another person. Okay, so that's the big step that flu viruses make when they jump species, and they don't do it very often. So in dogs, we actually have two different strains of flu. One came from horses. So in 2004, on the racetracks in Florida, uh, greyhounds started actually dying of severe respiratory disease. And it turns out they had actually have now an equine or a horse strain of flu. So the flu virus jumped from horses to dogs and started getting transmitted from dog to dog. That's the kind of the older flu virus that we had in this country. It's called H3N8. So that's the H is a three and the N is an eight. Again, that doesn't really matter, but that's what we call it, H3N8. Recently, uh, just a couple years ago, uh, a flu strain that was in dogs in Asia, mostly Korea, which started as a bird flu, which is H3N2, jumped into dogs, stayed in dogs, and we know in Asia since at least 2007, but in 2013 it came to this country uh, into a uh, shelter in Chicago and then stayed in this country. So this kind, and we, could, we should be proud of ourselves, we are a unique country. Uh, one of the things we're unique as we're the only country in the world that has two stable strains of flu in dogs. Um, uh, a fact that most of you probably didn't know. Fun fact, we are the only country in the world with two strains of flu in dogs. So we have the, the h 3 8 that we've had for a while and we have the h 3 n 2 the concern is with the H3N2, and hold on to this, put a pin in this one for a minute, people also have an H3N2 virus. Now, it's not the same H3N2 virus, but if I, get it, if I have a dog which is H3N2, and I get it, and I, and I have my own H3N2, the worry is, and why this, is, this becomes like a little science fiction, what if our H3N2s mate in the person or in the dog, and then we're going to get a whole new H3N2 that who knows what that's going to do. So, there is a lot of concern now amongst the flu community, and that is a community, what could happen in terms of mutation of viruses, recombination of viruses between people and dogs, because we all have an H3N2 virus. Whew. Okay. So this is uh, just a map of where the H3N8, the original flu virus, was in dogs. This is a map of where the new H3N2, all this green is states that have both viruses. So we deal with both viruses now in dogs. The vaccine we have for dogs now include the, that we recommend using includes both viruses, H3N8 and H3N2. Cats, cat flu is not really the flu. When we say cat flu, we're talking about herpes. That's really a misnomer. It's not really the flu. Cats never really had an influenza virus that we knew of until May 2017. Big outbreak at the shelter in, in Manhattan. Over 500 cats got a a um, H7N2 virus, also from birds initially. Um, big outbreak um, in this shelter. I don't know if you remember, it was in all the newspapers. They, they moved the cats to a warehouse in Queens. One person got it. So a person got it, the flu from a cat. Again, not earth shattering. It would have been earth shattering if then that person transmitted it to another person. That didn't happen. Um, but we don't, and, and it was really nicely taken care of and isolated and the outbreak subsided, but we don't really know what the true situation is in cats if there's this flu virus out there and why it, it, it we had caused such an outbreak in the shelter. And then people have HN1, H1N1 and H3N2 at the moment. Um, so th again, the worry, this is a different H3N2 than what dogs get, but what keeps people up at night 
There's so many things that keep me up at night. But one of the things that does keep me up at night is, again, a person with H3N2, a dog with H3N2, someone gets both of them, either the dog or the person, what's that going to do in that body when two related viruses have a chance to, to combine uh, with each other? Um, I'm going to skip a lot of this. You all know what the signs of flu are in, in dogs. It's basically the same as in people, coughing and runny noses. Um, most dogs with the flu do just fine. Um, it's really that only the dogs that are in shelters or in poor conditions and poor health in general that can have a really hard time with the flu and end up getting pneumonia from it. One of the challenges with the flu is that you can, the, the, the dogs have it and people and cats all have it and can be spreading it before they're sick. So it's really hard to isolate um, people or dogs with the flu and prevent them from shedding it because they, shed it, they spread it before they're sick. So you can't go into a doctor's office and say, okay, I'm going to sit next to this person who's not coughing. I'm not going to get the flu from that person. There's a good chance you're going to get the flu from that person because once you start coughing, there's only a few more days you actually are spreading it, and then you're done spreading. A lot of the spreading is done before you have clinical signs. Okay, I'm going to go through this quickly and basically get to the bottom line. Uh, treatment um, is really just supportive in all species. We don't use Tamiflu in, 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 um, in dogs typically. It's, there's often a shortage during the flu season and it's not thought to be the right thing to do in dogs. And again, most dogs have very mild disease. It looks just like a disease that you might have heard of called kennel cough. And if you don't actually diagnose flu, you cannot differentiate flu from other causes of kennel cough. So I'm going to skip through this and go to the bottom line is everybody needs to get flu shots. The only way to break this whole cycle of all these flu viruses playing with each other is for everybody to get our flu shots. So we need to get flu shots so we don't get it and we don't transmit it and our dogs should get flu shots so they don't get it and they don't, and they don't transmit it. Again, even though it's not such a horrible disease in dogs, the fact that there's this risk of this dog-human interaction. This is one health day, um, especially with that H3N2 virus, is enough reason in many people's minds to, to have dogs all be vaccinated so don't have to worry about it. So every fall, take your dog and go get a flu shot. Thank you. Any, now we can do questions. Yes. Yes. Here. There you go. Is that microphone? Um, I thought that the um, lepto that the vaccination that our dogs get only covers what like two or three out of the five variants or something like that is that the, the question was thank you the question was what is included in the leptospirosis vaccine so there are um, and obviously I didn't have time to go into all of this but there are a number of different strains of leptospirosis uh, there's probably two very common strains that we see in dogs uh, maybe three in this country there's four strains in the vaccine, um, and it does cover, if not all, at least the vast majority of strains that we actually see in dogs. It's very, very unusual for us to see leptospirosis in a vaccinated dog. So I think they, they do work. Yes, there might be the occasional dog out there that is not protected, but if that happens, it's really rare. So it's definitely worth, worth doing. Yes. Lyme disease. Uh, we have the vaccination for the dog. And we live in Maine part of the year and lots of deer ticks and so on. Does that vaccination protect the dog all year? And I don't have to worry about the dog? The Even question is covered with ticks. So, so the, the question was um, if our dog is vaccinated, even though we live in Maine, which is a special coastal Maine is one of the worst places. Um, New Jersey is probably worse, just in general, um, than coastal Maine <laughs> for a lot of things, yeah. Um, but no, coastal Maine is bad. Uh, the Cape is bad. Um, the, the kind of the pretty areas are bad. Anyway, um, the question is, is the dog protected for the whole year? So it, it, it depends on, so the answer is no. You shouldn't just always rely on the vaccine. Um, any, any vaccine potentially has the potential to be overwhelmed if we allow enough ticks on the dog, right? It's a question of, because so, nothing's 100%. So if I have a vaccine that's 99.6% uh, effective, and have one tick on that dog over the years, there's no question that dog will not get infected. But if I put a thousand ticks on that dog, then there is a chance that they could, that dog could actually get infected. So then the vaccines aren't perfect, so I would still recommend using tick control. The other thing is there's a lot of other diseases in those same ticks that, are, that we don't have a vaccine for. So we can't just say, okay, my dog's vaccinated, I don't have to worry about it. 
still stress to control. For instance, Frontline is a product that you can use. It's a, it's a spot on product. So yes, still use tick control and then vaccinate on top of that um, is, the, is the way to go. There's also pretty differences between the different um, types of vaccines in terms of how long they actually last, but we can talk about that off, offline. Yes. Uh, yes, um, it's great, you know, this education that you do, but there's a lot of miseducation out there. A few months ago, there's a story about, uh, and particularly in Brooklyn, there were all these dog owners who were refusing to get any vaccinations for their dogs because they're afraid their dogs are going to get autistic. And, I mean, I, wonder, I don't know how you combat that I kind know. of a... <laughs> well, the question was about kind of the anti-vaccine movement, and, and that's obviously borrowed from the human um, anti-vaccine movement. And, all we can do is try to do the best we can with facts, you know, and, and, um, and that obviously there's no evidence to support that in dogs or in people. Um, and I, I think maybe we're making progress. Um, I'm not sure. I think what we have to do as veterinarians is we have to make a case to the client that the disease um, is real and it's worse than any potential side effect of the vaccine. Because every vaccine has the potential to cause side effects. They're very, very rare. I mean, these are, we're talking about less than 1 in 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 have any reaction at all to the vaccines. But it's still putting foreign material in the dog's body. So I think all we can do is combat that with facts and, and talk about the prevalence of the disease. Here it's easy because I can walk down the hallway and show you sick dogs that would not be sick if they were vaccinated. Uh, but that, that is our challenge uh, for sure. Yes. Is there anything you recommend if you have a house cat? I know he's it's not a dog, but but you know, cats are okay too. Yeah, but <laughs> but I mean you know he's a house cat, so he keeps a very low profile. Mm -hmm. But you know I, you know we're out and about doing different things. Um, is there anything besides our flu shot? Is there anything that that could be transmitted to the cat or? Yeah. So the question was what about? So we don't have flu shots for cats yet. Uh, the question was what about what about indoor cats? Right. So so the. Every, every case is an individual. Um, if you have dogs and they bring, or, or you bring things into the house that can jump on your cat, like fleas and ticks and things, so we need to talk about you know, tick control for an indoor cat. Mosquitoes carry heartworms, so we need to talk about heartworm for an indoor cat. Um, and then, by law, we should be vaccinating all our cats for rabies. Um, so real, what we try to do is really tailor the protocol because we don't want to give stuff just because we can, because we have it. We try to look at the lifestyle and make recommendations um, specifically for that household. So you know, if you live in an apartment um, and the, you know, the windows are never open and there's never air circulating in, then potentially there's less risk. But even birds carry these ticks. So, um, and then also the cat could get out. So, so we don't recommend just ignoring indoor cats, but clearly their risk is smaller. So it becomes a conversation between you and the veterinarian to decide what is best for, for your cat. Great. Oh, one more, one more, two more questions. Yes. You said birds carry, um, I mean like parrots? You said birds carry what, avian flu? No. Oh, so. Parakeets? No. No, so, no, no. So, so I said birds carry ticks. Yeah, birds can bring ticks into that, into an apartment on the 17th floor. No, 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 outdoor birds, real oh, birds. Oh, okay. Real birds, okay. pigeons, pigeons, <laughs> pigeons, sorry. hawks, eagles, they, they can carry ticks into the, into the home. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, what, uh, what about, there have there been any incidences of influenza or Lyme in rabbits? Influenza or Lyme and rabbits, or the or the or even leptospirosis. You said any yeah. So leptospirosis can, get it. can definitely infect uh, rabbits. rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually, you know, there's a there's a story. There's a, a there were cases in a a um, petting zoo of, of rabbits that actually spread leptospirosis. They didn't get that sick themselves, but they were able to spread it spread to it. children uh -huh. uh, in oh. the in the petting zoo. I don't know anything about Lyme or flu in rabbits. I don't believe that they become clinical. They can probably get infected uh, because the ticks can feed on rabbits and they can have the bacteria. But most rodents don't show any clinical disease. But they're not uh, rodents. Or, they're or most, uh, most, right, most mammals, other than people that we know of, uh -huh. people, horses, and dogs, 
don't actually show disease from Lyme. So for instance, cows get infected all the time. We have a study going looking at beef cattle. If you look at beef cattle, they have like a million ticks on them. Um, yeah. It's disgusting, um, especially the organic ones, but whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and yet they don't get Lyme disease. So you can have a horse sick with Lyme disease standing with three ticks on it, standing next to a beef cattle that has a million ticks on it. They don't get Lyme. So we actually, in the Global Lyme Alliance, which is a human Lyme um, research foundation that I'm, I'm on the uh, board of, we have an ongoing study now trying to figure out what's in the cow immune system that prevents it from getting sick because it's clearly exposed, um, yet yeah, they don't get sick. So every species deals with disease differently. I'm not aware that rabbits get any of those diseases, actually. They can definitely spread leptospirosis. Okay, la la last, last question here on the right. Do you worry about the cows becoming susceptible to Lyme disease? The question was, do I worry about the cows becoming susceptible to Lyme disease? You know, I don't know. I, again, I worry about so many things. Um, we don't see a lot of, so, so, you know, Lyme has evolved quickly in that Lyme disease wasn't a thing until the 1970s. Uh, you know, and you can go back, Lyme disease in Europe, we know, has been around for centuries, but in the U.S. it has not. And um, unclear what happened, why it became uh, a disease in the U.S., and it's different in the U.S. than it is in Europe. It's a lot worse in the U.S. than it is in Europe. So I guess anything could happen. Um, but that's, I don't, I don't know that anyone is losing sleep over that, but I definitely think things could change very quickly. Okay, one last question here. Hi, a question about Lone Star ticks. Yes. Um, I've heard, like, your deer tick gets on you, you brush against something or mm -hmm. climbs up, but the Lone Star tick is more aggressive and goes towards you and has something much worse than Lyme, and is that just for people or for people and dogs? So that's a really good question um, the, the, about different types of ticks. So I only talked about the deer tick, the Exodus tick, because of the time constraints. But there are other ticks in our area, and one of them is the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick, or, or Emblem Americanum, is a tick that we used to think was isolated to the Mississippi Valley. But we know now that it's all over the Northeast, and it does cause disease in New England and in, um, all, all over the Northeast in people and in dogs. The, the most common disease that we see is uh, ehrlichiosis in people and in dogs, from ehrlichia so, uh, called ehrlichia ewingi which can be a very, very severe disease in, in people and in dogs from the Lone Star Tick. It is true that they're more likely to be out and about. They're less, like, they're less susceptible to dehydration. So the, remember, the, the deer tick always stays in a shaded area. They will not venture out onto the lawn. For instance, the Lone Star Tick are more adventurous. They're less likely to be damaged by the sun. So they do tend to come around more. The other thing is the Lone Star Tick is harder to kill. So some of the products that we use for killing ticks work pretty well against the deer tick, but don't work that well against the Lone Star tick. So when you're talking to your veterinarian, that's one question to ask is, hey, is this stuff that I'm using good for Lone Star ticks? Because I know we have it, and they can cause very significant disease in dogs and people. That's a really good question. On that note of severe disease in dogs and people, I'd like to thank you again so much for coming. Thank you for joining us on our One Health Day. And uh, we are always here at the Animal Medical Center, as well as the Houston Institute, to answer your questions. So please keep them coming online and in person. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>